Hello, everybody. Good morning. Everybody enjoying breakfast, right? Yes. All right. We have a surprise prize today. Um, a drone. <laughs> We're going to give one of these away at the very end of the event. We will let you know how to enter that uh, around the time of Q&A. So this will be here. Some person in this room is going to win that. You do have to be present to win it. So uh, everyone, sir, stick around. And I'd like to call up our speaker. Our esteemed speaker of this morning is the CTO of NoDB. Please welcome Seth Proctor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I assume I don't actually need this microphone for folks to hear me in the back. I assume everyone can hear me OK. Yeah, all right, good. Um, I think this is more for the recording and because I'm an esteemed guest, we can for posterity or something like that. Um, it's kind of loud. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I hope I hope the breakfast is good. Uh, I hope that the coffee is uh, at least adequate. Uh, usually when we do the this is still really serious. Uh, usually when we do these breakfast events, uh, we, we end up kind of doing two speakers. We have someone come in and talk about kind of the real world and things they're building and experiences, and then I, I come out and kind of wax philosophical about the changes that are happening. And, and I apologize because you're stuck with me alone today. Um, I will try to make it interesting. Uh, I'll try to make it entertaining. Uh, I'll try to you know recognize that it's early morning and uh, we, we, need some, we need some energy in the room. So. Uh, my name is Seth Proctor. I'm the, the CTO at NuaDB. Uh, for those of you who have not come across NuaDB before uh, in the vast landscape of databases that we have right now, uh, NuaDB is a is a product uh, is a project that we've been working on now for quite a long time, uh, really for seven or eight years. It's been on the market for a couple of years now, uh, and what it is is a transactionally consistent <coughs> SQL database. Uh, SQL is now like get and pool and report again. Uh, but but re-architecting, kind of fundamentally rethinking how you would build a relational database, a transactionally consistent database, if you were to step back and rethink kind of what modern architectures are today. Uh, and, and that's really what I want to talk about today, less about NuaDB. We'll come back at the end and talk a little bit about what NuaDB is specifically. Uh, but what I really want to talk about today is kind of why. Like, why, why are we doing this, and why are there other people out there that are doing this and kind of rethinking how you build systems. Uh, so the, the title of this talk is Architecting for the Cloud. Um, cloud means many things uh, to many people. Uh, and so I guess the first question besides kind of what is cloud is, is what is unique about cloud and why is this interesting? Uh, I suspect most people in this room uh, have been either going through the experience of trying to get into what I will loosely call a cloud architecture uh, or have been thinking about it, uh, or have been on the outside reading about it and trying to understand what this means, um, or have been like sitting at home ranting about how like all the buzz around cloud is just insanity uh, because it's nothing new. Um, and I, I will admit I fall into all of those categories to various degrees. I was at Sun Microsystems for a long time, and 15 years ago we were building things that we called horizontally scalable, that we called grid, that we called utility computing. That you know, I mean we're thinking about all, we didn't call them cloud yet, but we, you know, all these same ideas. Um, and uh, I don't think what's new right now is that we're finally understanding exactly what cloud is. I think it's more that what's happened is we've had enough time to kind of watch the evolution and changes in technology to start to understand that there really is a fundamental shift beyond just, you know, it's public cloud or private cloud, it's a particular stack, it's a particular API. It's more that we're starting to really understand at a fundamental level what, what has changed and what that means we need to change around it. So what's unique about cloud? Uh, when I talk about cloud and cloud architectures today, uh, I'm not talking about Amazon specifically or Google or any other public cloud. I'm not talking about needing cloud in your APIs or something like cloud stack. I, I'm really talking more about what is unique about the architectures that these represent. Whether these are public cloud, private cloud, you know, something on-prem, uh, whether it's really just that you are changing the way you're building internal data centers, what's different? What's changed? I think there are a couple key things that we're starting to see more and more uh, come under this umbrella. 
So one is the on-demand nature. Right? When people talk about cloud architectures, they're talking about systems that are that are agile, right? That you can scale out uh, for capacity, for availability as you need them. Uh, that means yes, you can go to public infrastructure, but it also means you can do dynamic provisioning. Right? So it's not kind of the thinking about something for a long time and then buying a large system. It's really what I need when I need capacity, I go get capacity. Uh, which means I don't have to think ahead of time as much about what that capacity is or how to provision. Uh, for those of you who have gone onto Amazon and you've configured a database using RDS, you found that a lot easier probably than actually trying to start up you know, your own machine in your data center and install software, yada, 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 yada. But at some point, you've been asked how many IOPS you want to provision. That's not cloud, right? That's, that's not what we're talking about. That's not really on-demand capacity. And, and that on-demand capacity gives you flexibility. Right? And flexibility is flexibility in terms of what resources you use, how you're going to use them, but increasingly it's about getting to commodity. Right? It's about not having to really think hard ahead of time about very specific high-end hardware or specific networks. It's about being able to use kind of whatever you have on hand to be able to pull in new kinds of capabilities as they, as they come up. I mean, what's happening right now, if people are watching kind of the, the intersection of the flash and the memory spaces right now, is phenomenal, the new technologies that are that are coming down the pipeline. And it's changing things at a really dramatic pace. And so the ability to have something that's on demand and flexible to be able to pull those things in as they start to become uh, like available to us mere humans, uh, as opposed to the people who right now are buying kind of the high-end stuff is, is pretty awesome. Uh, on demand capacity is great, flexibility is great. Uh, it naturally brings with it complexity. And so something else people really focus on when they're thinking about cloud architectures is how do you build into the core of your system a model for simplicity? And simplicity means a lot of things. And I'm going I'm to talk about this idea for the next 45 minutes that we're together. Um, but simplicity, you know, it comes from building monitoring APIs, from management APIs. Uh, it comes from this model of thinking about uh, the, the platform and how you work with it and how you automate it. Uh, simplicity really is the thing that says, I'm able to build a system that I can think about as a whole. And that helps you think about failure models, that helps you think about provisioning and resource allocation, that helps you understand when you're under provision, when you need to bring new things online. Uh, it helps you react to problems. Because as systems scale up and get more and more complicated, it can be harder and harder to see those things. And when you can react to those things, you get the thing that I think is most exciting and awesome about these architectures we're building, which is resiliency. And so we're all used to thinking about failover, we're all used to thinking about, you know, when something goes down, you can bring something else online, and what's the downtime, and you know, what's the capacity I needed for that. Uh, that's all great, but what we really want is not redundancy, what we want is resiliency. Right? We want to build models that are always running in a mode where when something fails, there's always something else running to pick up the slack. So you never go down. You just kind of shift where things are running. And then you can react on demand and bring new things online as you need them. Uh, and as we're building more and more of these kind of core <coughs> ideas into architectures, as we're letting this kind of these cloud ideas become more and more pervasive in every architecture that we build, we get more and more towards getting away from just a redundant model and really getting towards resilient models. And by the way, if you squint, right, this describes why telecom systems are so different than most other systems, right? This is why every time you pick up, well, when you used to be able to pick up a landline and there's a dial tone, <laughs> right? This is why the dial tone is there, right? The dial tone is always there. You may not be able to make a call, but the dial tone is always there because telecom systems have been designed for decades, uh, maybe longer, with, with these principles in mind, right? And it's just, it's on a different level. And what's really, I think, fun and cool about what's happening with all of this cloud architecture stuff and all these changes that are happening is that it's starting to like just become pervasive in everything we build that these are the like standard rights we should be given for how we build systems. And as, as a result, systems become more stable, they become easier to work with, they become much more resilient to failures, and then in turn you can build much more interesting services. And I think that's just awesome. So in other words, why are we excited? Like why is this interesting? Why do we like their different architectures? Uh, capacity cost-effectiveness, higher availability, better failure handling. Um, as people scale out and are running not just in one data center, but increasingly kind of in a global model, being able to harness lower latencies, there are all these awesome things you get as we start to build towards these new architectures. Uh, now, 
every distributed system, uh, in my mind, is an exercise in trade-offs. Uh, cloud is no different, and, and getting all these great things is great, but there are certain things that you pay to get them. Right? And so, what are some of the challenges? Uh, well, one thing is that failures do happen with increased frequency. You have more failures. Uh, by the way, getting to commodity is great because it's cheaper. There's a reason it's cheaper. I think probably everyone in this room knows that. Failures happen more frequently. They, ha they happen in kind of increasingly more interesting fashions. Uh, and that means not only is it nice to think about kind of increasingly resilient fault tolerant systems, but it's actually it's a survival skill, right? If you're not designing that way, you're not going to be able to get to commodity. It's not like, oh, now I'm on cheap disks, I save money. It's like, no, you, you, you need a thing that can actually understand that's on those new kinds of architectures. Um, it's more difficult to get a global view of a service, right? Probably most people in this room have, have had the experience where they're trying to understand what happened and they've got like five terminals up on their screen or in, in some of our cases like an order of magnitude more than five terminals up on the screen and they're looking at log files and, and someone didn't set NTP quite correctly so the timestamps aren't quite right on every machine and you're looking at like 40 different log files trying to correlate them and understand something just happened, what went wrong. Um, it is increasingly hard as you scale out and run in more and more places to get that holistic view of what happened to your service as a whole. So that's certainly a challenge. Uh, security and data lifecycle, by definition, is harder. There are more independent components running. There are more places you can interact with the service. Uh, if you're thinking about scale out as a combination of different technologies where you have data coming into one database, maybe you know, coming into some front end service, some operational thing, it's moving to Hadoop, it's moving to a warehouse, it's moving to, you're, you're, you're doing ETL over the graph databases, you want to be able to ask different questions. You now have multiple copies of the same data, but you have no idea that it's the same data. So you've lost the provenance of that data, you don't really know how to manage the audit, the security, the access controls. Um, so security in systems like this kind of by definition becomes harder. Uh, and everything else, like about, this isn't a, a like morning session on distributed computing. I'm sure most people in this room have at least passing experience here. If you don't, and you're bored this afternoon, go ask Wikipedia to, to name some of the canonical problems in distributed computing. It's great fun. For some of us, it's great fun. Uh, so lots of challenges, but things that we kind of understand how to do. Right, again, I suspect many people in this room have had the experience of actually thinking about or deploying things at scale. And you know, load balancers, name services, app servers, caching and CDNs, uh, you know, storage defined networking. We kind of understand how to scale a lot of things the way people are building clouds. Again, whether that's public cloud, whether that's in your data center, we kind of understand how to do a lot of these things. Uh, the real challenge, in my opinion, is scaling the database. That's the thing that's really hard to scale. Uh, and before I talk about why that's hard to scale, um, I want to talk about why I think this is, this is important, right? Because once upon a time when we built systems, the database was the platform, right? The database was the thing that, that was the starting point. And you said you get all these nice capabilities out of it. And so all of the other applications that we write layer on top of it. And they can take advantage of the capabilities of that core platform. Uh, and as we've scaled out, you know, one of the things we're really good at as an industry is being pragmatic. And thinking about, you know, there are problems I have to solve. The tools today don't necessarily let me solve them. So, so how do I, how do I get a system up and running? How do I deploy something? How do I make something work? And so, we're really good at taking the tools we have and and trying to make something out of them. And that's meant, in many cases, as we'll talk about over the next few slides, that we've broken this notion of kind of what the core database can provide as a platform that applications can build on top. We've pushed more knowledge into the applications. We've kind of segmented more and more what the, what the platform can provide. And in my mind, that, that's kind of unfortunate. It's also a real challenge. Because if you think about this thing that people keep talking about, this migration to the cloud, and then you think about enterprise applications, and kind of traditionally what, what that means. Well, we just said cloud is all about commodity and on-demand virtualization, and that's all great. But in my mind, Enterprise applications, and by enterprise, I don't necessarily mean like Fortune 100, because another great thing I think that's great about cloud is it's like very, it's very democratizing. It's like cloud is this thing that exists everywhere, and public cloud is this thing that exists anywhere, so like startups can build things that are by every definition enterprise worthy, uh, which, is, which is really cool. Like I'm definitely not a class word. I think it's just like awesome that everyone can do 
do this, right? And it's, it's causing all these little, like different mismatch of things. But people who are used to thinking from the point of view of enterprise applications are used to thinking about availability and they're used to thinking about transactional consistency for a wide variety of reasons. And so we have a massive number of applications, massive number of like people with experiences out there, massive number of assumptions about how you build systems that need these capabilities. And so cloud is great, but if I can't treat the database in the cloud as my platform, if I can't take my application, move it to these cloud architectures, and still get global consistency, it means I can't just take those applications and move them over, and now I'm stuck. So scaling the database in a cloud architecture is hard, but more importantly, I think that's an important thing to focus on, because if we could make the database just scale in these cloud architectures, then this is something that's possible. Uh, so why is it hard to, 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 to scale databases? Uh, I probably don't have to belabor the points on this slide. I, I suspect most people in this room have at least passing understanding of this, right? You go back to the 1970s, you go back and look at what System R was coming out of IBM. Um, it, was, it was an interesting exercise, uh, among other things, it was an interesting exercise in using very limited resources. Uh, in recognizing that there was very little disk, there was very little cache, there was very little IO path. And so the way you built a system as effectively as possible was essentially to build something modeled after virtual memory. To say put data on disk as pages, those pages move really nicely into memory. We can lay out pages so that that's really fast to do, so that moving the disk head across those pages <coughs> is really efficient to prefetch. And now you get a system that can respond to queries but can actually work with the fairly limited resources. And System R was another thing as well, which was a, it was a first attempt at, at SQL, right? At, at something that is a declarative language. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not hung up necessarily on SQL syntax being the best thing, but I think the declarative notion of SQL is genius. Because that's the thing that says, this is a system you program by telling it what you want to do, not how to do it. And so over time, it means we can evolve how you lay out data, how you form queries, how you work with information, and it doesn't change the front end of describing the thing you're trying to solve. So I'm, I'm all in for declarative systems. However, if you fast forward 40 years, we're still building a lot of databases uh, with kind of that disk at the heart architecture. Kind of that notion, again, I said earlier about IOPS. We talk a lot about IOPS in the data industry. I think that informs a lot of the vertical scale we do. Uh, we try to cache. Caching breaks, the consistency model of caching has its own challenges. Uh, HA systems, as a result, become very expensive because they really become, in large part, about the disk. And if anyone in this room has tried to deploy Rack uh, or has to deploy, has tried to, to deploy Pure Scale, has anyone in this room done Pure Scale? Awesome technology, like like the IBM architects. I I, I really love a lot of what they did. Um, for most of us, we can't afford it. Um, and again, I think it's not cloud because it doesn't get you kind of out of, you know, out into this on-demand and commodity and whatever else. Uh, but for people who are trying to build just streaming giant systems and can build something very localized, it's pretty interesting with the technology. Right? But that's the direction you end up going, is more and more towards special purpose hardware, high-end disk systems, high-end networks, things that are, by definition, not on-demand capacity. Uh, it also has these interesting side effects, uh, schema, is hard to evolve because, again, schema is very tightly coupled to exactly how data is laid out on disk. Uh, and it turns out applications want to evolve over time. So we have the choice of throwing away schema, or we have the choice of being very careful up front about defining schema. Neither of those is really satisfying, I personally don't think. I think you want a third door. You want the ability to, to start with a schema but evolve it in a very simple, non-intrusive way over time. Uh, it's hard to harness commodity infrastructure, I think I believe, at that point not designed to scale out. So that's all great, but, but I said earlier, you know, we're really pragmatic. We're good at kind of finding ways to solve problems. And for the last at least 10 or 12 years, we've been building these architectures, right? And we built it through one of many different paths. And again, I'm sure if I took a, a show, well, okay, show of hands. How many people in this room have worked on a system that employs one of these three technologies, one of these three approaches? So good, a good enough for the, for the video, good, good number of hands went up, that's good. Uh, 
So I think people are pretty familiar with these ideas, right? You can take a traditional database and you can do replication. Uh, either you can replicate from one place to another and say you can only read it there, or you can try for multi-master replication, which is great because then you have lots of places you can work with data. It's challenging because you either pay high latency penalties for things like two-phase commit or you lose transactional consistency. And both of those are, are choices. Um, you can shard a system, right? You can take something and completely break it into lots of independent databases, and these could be SQL databases, or they could be NoSQL databases, they could be some other new flavor of thing. Um, but basically what you're really saying is, I can decide up front something about data that never interacts with other pieces of data, and then I can totally separate it. Uh, and that's challenging in terms of having to decide up front how you make those separations. It also means you don't have that single view of the database. And when you lose one shard, when something fails in some unexpected way, when the whole system goes down and then only part of it comes back up, how do you understand what state you're in? That's the real challenges. And then of course, as things evolve and you want some global understanding of your system, you can't have that. Uh, you can also take the approach of just saying, well, really consistency is overrated. SQL's not what people are doing anymore. Uh, we'll just get rid of that whole consistency thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll push correctness and kind of conflict and everything else up to the application. And that's that, you know, losing the using the database as a platform, right? We have the database as a platform, we could rely on it for things for decades. And this is kind of saying, yeah, let, let each application kind of sort it out. We'll make the platform very simple, the applications will be heavy and rich. Um, the architectures become much simpler, but each application becomes more complicated, there's more pain there, it's very costly. Right? Anyone who's had to go through this experience probably has found there are things that are great that you get from it in terms of performance, in terms of flexibility, uh, things that are harder. I, you know, without kind of making this a, a religious commentary, which is like no good over breakfast, um, I will say this about the, the consistency discussion, which is, I, I, you know, whether it's SQL or whether it's some other language, whether, you know, what the thing is you're working with, I think what we're seeing in the industry is a, is a consensus where everyone is kind of getting back in the same place and saying this whole idea about throwing away consistency is a terrible idea. Like maybe SQL's not the language, maybe it should be something else, but consistency, the idea that I know something about my data, and when I interact with my data, I know the rules about interacting with it. And when someone else is interacting with the same data, I know the rules about how we're interacting. And when the system fails while that's happening, I know something about the state of the data when it fails, and I know something about the state of the data when it comes back. Like those are all really good things. And, and me personally, I've had to build very large cloud systems. I've had to build um, things that on the front end did not have any notion of transactions. Um, but on the back end, it killed me losing this because just what you can reason about in terms of failure models, how you can do backup and recovery, how you can actually manage and operate a system. Um, so to me, like this is, this is one of the things that's really interesting is when you watch what's happening in the communities around like Mongo, um, around Couch, uh, around all of the NoSQL systems that started out by saying we're not going to have consistency and now we're starting to figure out how do we bring that back into the fold. This is, this is becoming, I think, increasingly common. And this is something we'll see over the next few years is everyone getting back on the bandwagon, whether it's ACID, whether it's BASE, whether it's you know whatever other new interpretation. Uh, I, I don't think there are gonna be many systems that people build going forward that provide global serializability for, for the people who certainly care about geeking out about like what that means. <coughs> Uh, you know, we can have that conversation afterwards because most people don't want to go through it. But uh, I, I don't think we'll see many of those systems, but we will increasingly see people who care about this because it's, it's really critical. And if you don't have consistency, or if you are trying one of these approaches I had on the last slide, what are the side effects, right? Why, why aren't these good solutions? Uh, I'm arguing that you really want the platform to be something that provides core capabilities. Uh, what happens if you lose that? Well, applications are tied to deployment. I really, to me, this is one of the hardest things. I, I love the, the, the DevOps movement that's happening because I think every developer should have to wear a pager for a week. We don't really have page, we don't have the dial tone, we don't have pagers. We, we, we used to have pagers, some people still have pagers. I believe every developer should have to do that to understand the pain, to understand how frustrating it is when you're talking to someone at three in the morning and they're like, I need my data back, your system sucks. And you're like, well, what happened? Well, I fat fingered something and accidentally dropped 40 rows out of them. Oh, so it's not my system. You're the idiot. You're like, just get it back. <laughs> like, I mean, 
Seriously, I mean, for those of you who don't know, like this conversation happens every day, and it's it's just it's maddening, but it happens, and you have to get back and do it. Developers should appreciate that this happens. Operators should understand that code is not this magical thing that that appears, right? It's art and it's science. It's hard work. It's very complicated to build. Um, there's a reason that it's always late and it's never promising what you want and it's always crashing and everything else. Because code is hard to build, right? These two communities should like should really appreciate what the other does. Uh, all that said, I don't believe it should be a necessity that a developer also has to be an operator or that an operator has to be a developer. And, and I don't believe that we should have to be building software that assumes that in order to scale. And that, that one really concerns me. Um, I think we should be able to build application logic and we should be able to think about our operational model. And then when someone comes along and says, good news, you've got a budget to buy more systems, we should be able to drop those systems in and not have to rewrite the application logic. And when it turns out suddenly you're getting hit for 10x more capacity than you used to be hit because your site's gotten really popular, you shouldn't have to go back and like reshard things or think about like a new model for your application logic. You should just plug in more resources and keep going. Um, because this is, you know, this is complexity. It's hard to make changes. It's hard to understand the failure models. The operator at three in the morning should be able to say, I understand something about failure, or I understand how to do backup and recovery, or I understand how to change something about the resources that are being used. I should be able to upgrade my system, and it shouldn't have any impact on knowledge of the internal workings of the code or require a push to code to change something. Um, all of these things we're talking about, sharding and, and, and uh, you know, non-consistent systems and everything else, more independent pieces, I talked a lot about this, harder to interpret the failures because there are more independent pieces, complexity, complexity, complexity. And I said at the beginning, one of the, the hallmarks, I think, of how you build successful cloud architectures is all about simplicity. It's all about lots of moving pieces, yes, but being able to think about them in a clear fashion. Um, there are a couple other interesting things, I think, that are happening right now. I said earlier, part of what I love about uh, public cloud and part of what I love about kind of what it's doing to how we think about architectures in general uh, is this kind of democratizing thing where more and more capabilities are available to everyone. And I think that's that's having a couple of interesting effects. Uh, one of them is around the way we think about the baseline for systems. And, and it used to be that we build a system and we run on one machine and then maybe it would run like with a backup on a second machine. And then maybe you'd kind of like figure out a way to get active or do some kind of replication between those machines. And then eventually you were like, uh, okay, but that's not good enough. What if the whole data center goes down? And so now you're doing some kind of replication to a second data center because you want fault tolerance, you want a DR model. And then you're realizing that actually that's kind of frustrating because you're paying for two servers and only using one. So can't you get like some kind of active active model? And then someone came along and said, well, cloud is kind of that. I should be able to do active in many places. Uh, and by the way, I've got users in many places. They probably want different experiences, right? And so we're, we're seeing, at least I'm seeing, as, as I talk to people in, in my community, this movement towards global operation, this movement towards this idea that the baseline right now is always running your services in more than one physical location. And that might be like you've got a data center in Manhattan and a data center over in New Jersey, and, and that counts as two, right? Or it might be you've got something east coast and west coast, or it might be that you're running something in the US and Europe. Because there are lots of different reasons, there are lots of different things people want, right? Some people really want just that disaster recovery view of the world. That's really all they care about. Uh, some people are thinking about users that are geographically distributed, and they want to give them low latency access to their service. And again, if they can build on a platform that is the database, uh, and that platform gives them low latency access to their data, uh, then they can give low latency access to their users, and that's great. Uh, for some people, it's about simplifying data access. It's that like the East Coast users really tend to stay on the East Coast, the West Coast users tend to stay on the West Coast, and so you just don't want to pay the physical cost of storing the data in both places and moving it around. You might still want like an East Coast user to be able to travel to the West Coast and get at their data quickly, uh, but that's not about where you store the data, that's about being able to get at the service effectively. Uh, increasingly, it's also about residency. It's also about the use cases where you say, I'm not allowed to take data off of disk in certain countries because I'm running in Europe. And that means that if I have PII on behalf of a German citizen, it stays on disk in Germany, there's no choice. Uh, and if 
if I expand my service and I'm also running in Italy, well, Italy has its own laws, and France has its own laws, and the EU is codifying them in a way that both simplifies and greatly uh, complicates all those laws. So again, people are looking for something really entertaining to do this afternoon. Choice one, read about distributed computing. Choice two, uh, go read about the latest EU uh, regulations that are, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're really interesting, right? And then you can go read about like all of the, the hubbub about the right to be forgotten and all those other things. I mean, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of really interesting things. But fundamentally, again, it comes back to, can you assume a platform to build on, right? Can you, can you have a common platform that gives you the ability to address these residence things, and then can you all your applications build on top of it? I think these are, these are becoming increasingly things people are looking for, not as one-offs in the application, but as things they can assume they can build on in the platform so that all their applications can take advantage of these capabilities. Good question? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I understand this, but at what point does um, this model start to disintegrate? So I'll give you an example. Let's say I have a database, which is a large database, of one terabyte. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So the question essentially was, uh, as you as you reach larger data set sizes, you get all kinds of challenges around replication, uh, around latencies, uh, around other issues, and and do you hit limits? And the answer is, of course, you do, because if nothing else, physics. So uh, until the entire world is like you know quantum entangled and everything just is magically everywhere, yes. There are limits. And again, I'll come back to something I said earlier, which is I think every distributed system is an exercise in trade-offs. And part of why I list this list is because I think everyone is thinking about very different things that they're trying to optimize for when they are running at global scale. And in particular, we have customers with applications where they write the application once, and then different instances of it are deployed for different customers with different requirements. Some people are running very high value transactions very infrequently um, that need kind of global agreement. Other, other instances of the same application are running massive numbers of very low value business transactions. Um, they're much more worried about kind of localization. They're much less worried about um, kind of the, the global replication of data. Uh, and so the, the ability to make those decisions, I think, is, is critical because you you you've identified one of the key issues here, which is that there is no one answer to this. There's no, you know, the channel like stone breaker, you know, one size does not fit all. There really are, you know, multiple different views that you want. Um, and that's really kind of the point of this bullet here, is that, is that these global operation models in many people's minds are trade-offs between latencies and safety, right? There's the like, well, I can do two-phase commit, and between the US and Europe, that means like an extra, uh, I don't know, 100 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds for every transaction, right? Some people, that's fine. They don't care because they're doing like five transactions a day and each transaction's worth a billion dollars. Like, yes, please. That's fine. You know, other people are doing millions of transactions a day. Uh, those transactions tend to be localized. And if you lose one, like someone's gonna call up their bank and be like, the five bucks I deposited aren't there. And they're like, sorry, okay, here it is. Here's your five dollars, right? And they're, they're willing to run in a different model. Um, I think, the other, the other answer to your question is kind of the second goal, which is that increasingly, the way I think about the right way to make these kind of global operational models scale is to think about how you're storing data as a separate concern for the interaction. I mentioned this earlier, just kind of in passing, but I think increasingly there's this important idea of, of separation of kind of storage within a data platform from the service that that data platform is providing, right? You think about uh, you think about what Oracle is, right? Oracle is a thing you can interact with. Uh, Oracle, the, the database, not Oracle, the, the company. None of us wants to interact with Oracle. <laughs> Sorry. Are there any Oracle people in here before I <laughs> get channel my? Uh, sorry. So I don't mean to pick on Oracle. We'll, we'll, we'll pick a different company. Company Foo is a company that you can interact with. They make a product called Bar, uh, and uh, and and. And if it's a database, right, it has an API, people are used to programming JDBC or ODBC or you know, something to that database. As I said earlier, it's SQL, so it's declarative, so you have the ability to say what it is you want to do, not how you do it. All of that is a service interface. 
And then behind the scenes, stuff happens in memory, uh, stuff happens on the network, and eventually stuff happens on disk. Right? And, and I made the argument that in traditional architectures, there's a fairly tight coupling between what's happening in terms of the memory, what's actually happening as the service, and, and that storage layer. And I think increasingly, the way we make these global operations models work, the way we get to, I'm sorry, what was your name in the back? So the, the way we get to your, your requirements is very much to think about that separation of what is that service versus the storage model. Because storage is one of those things that's a real bottleneck when you think about the on-demand part, when you think about commodity, when you think about running in multiple locations. We have another question here. Scott, a couple of two observations. One is database size is the use for metric frequently is turnover. Mm -hmm. Float. A terabyte database would be megabyte per day turnover, qualitatively different than a terabyte database that literally turns over the full terabyte every day. Yes. For replication and every, all of the concerns. Secondly, uh, you've alluded to it a couple of times, let me just say it out loud. Compliance and accountability. There's also a need to account for what your business did to people, to external yes. regulators and external proceedings of some kind. If your database is inconsistent, then you can track back what really happened, you can't answer the question when the judge wants to know the answer. Completely agree. So so for people in the room, there were, there were two comments there. One was that you know, a terabyte database ingesting a few bytes a day is very different than a terabyte database that's turning over and ingesting a new terabyte every day and then aging things out. Um, completely agree. And, and the second comment was that in many of these systems, the hard problem is, is auto. I'll, I'll summarize it there. That's a good summary. And for folks who are interested, uh, particularly in this residence, I've been doing some talking recently in the residence space, working on some new standards groups in this space, actually. And I, that's my thesis. I just, I is see, that, is I that see the, the yeah, is that, is that the hard part, the hard part with, especially the residence issues, but for many of these things, is, is not about management of the system. Just like, you don't want backup. You want recovery. Backup is a really nice feature. Recovery is the thing that you actually want in practice. Um, separation of data being able to store it in many places is great. It's, it's the audit trail, it's the proof about that that you want. And part of what we're really saying, just to really like finish this point and then we can move on, is that fundamentally as we're building out modern architectures, the database is not the disk and cannot be the disk. The database is the service. The database is the thing that scales that works in this great new cloud world. Uh, when we can get to this as a platform, we can think about all the capabilities that we want in the database as being a service, and then we can think separately about storage, we can do some pretty exciting things. And that gets to the question of how you do audit management, that gets to the question of how you actually manage large scale databases over large geographic regions. Um, you're also getting to another interesting issue, which is, a couple of interesting things I said are happening. One is kind of this movement towards global operation. The other thing I think that's really interesting right now that we're seeing get pushed and pushed and pushed is the evolution of what operational means. So 10 years ago, I think most people kind of in, in most shops would think that they understood kind of what an operational database is. An operational database is a, it's a SQL database, probably tops out around one or two terabytes. Um, obviously that's that's not a hard limit. Lots of databases go bigger, but I think in, in the mainstream, in fact, in the mainstream, a lot of people be like, oh yeah, I got my 50 gigabyte database, and it's like never getting bigger than that, and it's the like, it's the workforce for my entire shop. Um, but there were things that we kind of understood we just didn't do that, right? And that's why we have data warehouses. Um, that's why we have so many other pieces of infrastructure around databases. That's why replication has often been for, for taking data into systems where we can do analysis. And that's why over time we've had all this like explosion of different kinds of databases because there really are all these different kinds of problems we're trying to solve. And recently, I think one of the things that's happening is people are getting a little bit frustrated at all the different databases you have to manage, all the different places your data lives, the fact that you don't have that common platform. And so we're trying to cheat. We're trying to pull more and more. So more and more I talk to people um, who say, you know, my operational database is it's, it's six to 10 terabytes of data, that's kind of really where it is. For exactly that reason, because it's, it's, less, it's less data that's now kind of rolling over out of the database every day. There's still data rolling out, but there's more and more you want to keep in it, because you want to be able to do that real-time analysis. Right? 
the stuff that's going to go into the warehouse, there will always be data warehouses. There will always be places where you have lots of data that sits around to do long-term analysis. But if you want to do real-time dashboards, if you want to do intelligent fraud analysis, if you want to do kind of any number of other interesting, either real-time or predictive analytics, that's a hard thing to do in traditional databases. More and more people want to do that. Uh, more and more, there's this interest in saying, why do I have to have a document database and a graph and a, and a SQL database or some other kind of model? Uh, you know, there really are places where I want some structure, places where I want less structure, or places where I really want my, you know, my Mongo tools, my front end, the places where I really want SQL. It's kind of frustrating having to manage all those different databases. So you see more and more databases trying to bring in different models. Um, sometimes it's just about the programming model. Uh, sometimes it's things like graph, which I think is one of the interesting things that's finally starting to kind of get the recognition it deserves, which is great because graph databases are things that let you ask very different questions. And they're really great at discovery, and they're really great at hypothetical questions. Right? What if I did the following? What effect will it have? That's a hard thing to do in a relational database. And graph databases are really well suited to that. But it's a pain if you have to then say, I've got all my data here, and I'm constantly doing ETL out to here to be able to then ask those questions. And so I see more and more interest in like, how do you get more of that in the same place? Which implies larger data sets, um, disjoint access and cache patterns on the same database, which for most traditional databases is very hard, right? Most databases are designed assuming a particular kind of access pattern, a particular kind of caching model. Uh, bringing those in tends to cause a lot of thrash. Uh, latencies start to add up very quickly, especially if anyone's done any work with graph, uh, latencies are what kill you, right? It's like a query might mean you have to actually do like nine separate queries. There's no kind of global optimizer that you can run anymore. And so that, that add up of latencies can be really challenging. Take those two together, and we get some really interesting new kind of global operation requirements. Um, talked about active in multiple locations with global consistency. Again, if you don't have consistency, made this assertion at the front, I, I still believe it half an hour later. If you don't have global consistency, you can't take all of those years of applications and experience and just move them into this world. Right? So you need, first of all, the platform to expose what looks like that same consistent view that you had when you were running on a single machine. Uh, there are these really interesting use cases that come out around residence and governance and where your data lives both on disk, the storage layer, and where it's available or resident in memory, the service. Right? When you think about storage and services as separate things, you can actually start talking at that level. You can say, yes, my German data lives only in disk in Germany, and maybe some of that data can only be brought into memory in Germany, but maybe other pieces of that information can be brought elsewhere. And if anyone's ever done any work like in the energy space and like mining, this has been a problem that, that the industry's been grappling with for like 20 or 30 years, really trying to understand this. In fact, like South American countries have been genius at monetizing this. The idea that like information, you drill in a country and you collect a lot of information about that country before you go drill. You do all kinds of uh, you know, geo uh, uh, audit and you learn a lot about the, the physical space. And then you take that data and you send it back to the mothership where you've got your data center and you do a lot of analysis. You bring it back into the country, now you're ready to do drilling, and they say, great, and there's a value-added tax on that information now. And you're like, how do you, how do you measure that? And like, it will get back to you. <laughs> and like, this has happened, it's brilliant. It's, I wish I'd thought about this business model, because like, there's an equal genius to it that's just like on another level. And that's, anyway, um, so you get these interesting use cases there. Uh, increasingly, what these things are forcing to get, again, simplicity, being able to have some kind of holistic view of a system and being able to really run at the right levels, increasingly about driving systems by policy, thinking about SLAs as the way that you define a system, not as a collection of processes, not as a collection of things that you've installed on a <coughs> file of hosts, but as a pool of resources that you say, here's my SLA, make my service run the way I want it to. That lets you get out of kind of a reactive mode into much more of a proactive mode, which is really that resiliency thing, which I'm gonna argue is what everyone in this room really wants. Um, and increasingly, that's, it's all about these multiple models. It's about being able to work with one model for one kind of query, work with a different model as you're thinking about different kinds of questions you want to ask, and increasingly not having that tied to how you store data. Right? We're used to thinking about, well, I, my relational database is a row store. When I want to do analysis, I need a column store. And then when I 
you know, when a document's stored, I'm going to write my data differently. When I want a graph store, I'm going to write my data differently to disk. Well, that's great, but it means I can't take my relational database and then query it as if it was a graph database because I'm focused on the storage model. So when you, again, when you get out of that storage model and you're thinking about, yes, there's data that I'm storing, but I'm really focused on the service, you can start to do some interesting things. Or I could have cut to the chase 40 minutes ago and I could have said, good morning, everyone. My name is Seth Proctor. My central thesis today is that cloud is the evolution from client-server architectures to distributed architectures. And we could have skipped, so I apologize we could have skipped the last 40 minutes, but hopefully it was interesting. Hopefully people are going to take something away from it. But this is, this is kind of what I think we're talking about, right? Cloud is not Amazon or Azure or something like that. Cloud is not a particular piece of software or API. Cloud is this fundamental change that we're going through, right? We did this when we went through, I, sorry, I wasn't there, but I understand we did this when we went through mainframe to client server, um, and we're doing it again now. We're going to we're going to distributed architectures. It's taken us a long time to understand enough about how you build distributed systems, um, but we're just, we're now starting to get into this model, and what that means to me, among other things, is we're trying to understand how we move on from the client server software that we've been retrofitting the last 10 or 15 years, and how we build fundamentally new software on fundamentally new architectures to be able to do that. We have a, a like a, a standard slide we use. I, I don't usually print our, our marketing slides, but this one's actually kind of technical, so I, I like this one. No offense to the marketing people in the room. Uh, uh, you know, there's kind of, the, long ago, people would ask us when, when I'd go in and talk about new ADB, and they'd say, great, are you, are you shared disk or shared nothing? Because that's, that's the only two choices, they'd say. You know, that's, that's an accepted truth. Databases are either shared disk or shared nothing as they scale up, which are you? And we kept saying, well, we're, we're actually not either. They're like, well, you gotta be one. Like, that's, that's all, it's the only two choices. That's what there is. And then, of course, Google did us a great favor by coming out with a system called Spanner, and then building on top of Spanner a system called F1, and then building some other interesting things on top of it based on atomic clocks and high-speed networks and some really interesting internals. The paper's really good, by the way. If you haven't read the Spanner paper, it's surprisingly readable. Um, read it, you know, but it's not, it's not a thing that most mere mortals can build, but it's a really interesting piece of technology. And they basically said, no, actually, there, is, there are other ways of thinking about architectures, right? And so what have we done at NewADB? For those of you who are interested about NewADB and, and why I spend all this time thinking about clouds is because I really think that we need new architectures to be able to take advantage of the way we're building systems today and then be able to expose that next generation platform that gives you all the things you want around security, around resiliency, um, around kind of that, that global transactional view that lets you take last generation applications and bring them into the future but then build some really crazy new things going forward. And so what we've done is, is something we call a durable distributed cache totally different view on the world. Um, and uh, what do I mean by a durable distributed cache? Well, I mean a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, I think starting from a caching point of view is really important because that puts the database in memory. Uh, and by putting the database in memory, I, I don't mean necessarily that all of the data is in memory. And I don't mean we're doing that because we're running at memory speeds, although we are running at memory speeds, which it turns out are faster than running at disk speeds, so that's good. Uh, but what I really mean is that now we get this model of focusing the optimizations that you build in a system on what's happening in memory, not the disk. Right, so we've really hoisted the database into a thing that is a collection of caches, a collection of in-memory processes where you can really build interesting optimizations there. Caches by their nature, I think, are transient. They're on demand, they're hierarchical. These are, these are powerful things that we've built off of for, for decades, right? This is a kind of a standard set of capabilities that let us build some really cool systems. Um, transient meaning that we're not thinking about caches being a point of durability, we're still talking about durability, um, but they are things that can just fail at any time, and that shouldn't affect the correctness of the system, that shouldn't affect the capabilities of the system. Uh, on demand, meaning that you don't really want an in-memory database. Sorry, are there any SAP people here? Okay, so love a lot of SAP technology. I was just make a comment about HANA, and then one, once again, make a brand comment about a company. Right, HANA's a great example of a database where you're really bringing all the data into memory. Right, or MemSQL, if anyone's played with MemSQL, bringing all the data into memory, right? For some people, that's a reasonable trade-off. It's a reasonable decision. Again, I'll go back to the start of this talk. 
I think you want to do systems that are on demand. I think you want to build systems that are cost effective. I think you want to use the resources you need. And to the comment here earlier, if you have a database with massive amounts of data but a long tail pattern, where very little of that data is active currently, and a lot of it is kind of around for historical reasons, you don't really want to pay the cost for any all to memory. Right? So you really want a system that's on demand. And by the way, on demand systems have the nice property, because they're on demand caches, that caches do this thing called locality. Right? If you have work going on here and you have work going on here and it's disjoint work, those caches form in a disjoint fashion. And if you are optimizing around what's in memory, not what's on disk, then you can take advantage of that. You can say, you know what, let's run the protocols for coordination of those caches with knowledge of where data lives in cache. So that this set of things and this set of things are operating independently. By the way, that's what we do in NuDB. And that's why we can scale out on LAN. And that's why we can also scale out across multiple data centers. Because if your East Coast users are working with different data than your West Coast users, then we're running at LAN latencies because we're taking advantage of on-demand caches. But we're still providing a globally consistent model. <laughs> um, caches are also hierarchical by nature. And so as the world evolves, and as disk and memory get closer and closer, we get all these interesting technologies, Systems built on a caching model are able to take advantage of those in really interesting fashions. Um, and that's something uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about kind of going forward with NuDB. You'll see a lot more about that. I think it's pretty interesting. Durable distributed cache. Distribution. To me, distribution means many things. We've, we've used it to mean many things. Uh, if you ever took a class in distributed computing and you go back and you crack open that book, you'll see a definition early on. It says distribution is about a collection of independent peers uh, that know how to coordinate with each other through message passing or some other formalism. Um, independent peers, meaning that you really have like two different things running and they can do the same thing. And they can go off and they can really do it completely independently. But when they know there's a thing that could affect the other, they coordinate with each other, they communicate with each other. Right? So that's not shared disk, that's not shared nothing, that's distribution in the true sense of the word, that you only sh you only coordinate on the things you need to coordinate on, but because those two peers are equivalent, you get this uh, immediately this really nice model for resiliency. Because if either of those peers fails, you lost some capacity, but the system still has full um, ability to do everything it should do. And so, if you build a system out with that, you don't have the notion of a like a hashed system where you're like, oh, I lost one of my, you know, I lost, you know k minus n of my nodes, and therefore like there's a whole subset of the database I can't access, or a whole set of queries I can't run anymore. You know, the worst case you're gonna say is, well, I can't run as many queries anymore because I don't have as many processing points. Uh, given these two things, what does durability mean? Well, durability now becomes about safety, right? Durability is not where you optimize the system. Uh, does a database always care about IO in the end? Yeah, of course it does. Because if you're writing data to disk, and you care about that being in the synchronous path, then you're going to care about IO. If you're, if you're ingesting piles and piles and piles of data, do you care about the disk? Yes, of course you do. But as you move the optimizations further and further away from disk into memory, durability becomes about safety. And when durability is about safety, now you can ask all these interesting questions we were asking about earlier. You know, am I deploying my system because I'm focused on kind of multiple points of replication, or am I focused more on putting data near to where my users are? Or am I focused on requiring that data can only be stored in particular locations for audit and compliance and governance reasons? And you can think about these issues completely independently from how you scale the service. And if, like NuDB, you're running with a service that still provides what looks like a single logical system, you can make both of those decisions completely independent from how you write your application which lets you actually take those existing applications, move them into a cloud architecture, and then start thinking about it. Uh, at a high level, for those of you who are curious, this is what a NuDB database looks like running. It's a collection of pure processes, uh, independent processes that are all the same, that are all able to do the same workload, that are all able to take on the same queries. Some of them are purely in memory and transient and do the, the running of the transactions. Some of them store data. Um, and there's an abstraction layer we've built where what they're really coordinating around is not SQL, it's around a distributed object system. 
objects that understand that they play a role in the system, that they represent a particular kind of data, um, but are very simple to work with, which makes our storage model very simple compared with MVCC. It makes our storage model essentially an append-only model that can be highly asynchronous, highly optimistic. Um, makes the storage model really look like a key value model. And makes the front end something that today is SQL, but is not tied specifically to the semantics of SQL, not tied specifically to the syntax of SQL, tied simply to the idea that what we're trying to build is a platform for doing transactional scale-up. And scale-up that should work in a data center or across multiple data centers. Uh, and so if that front end is SQL, and that's what you love, that's great. If your front end is something else, uh, maybe even commingled with SQL, maybe a graph and SQL sitting side by side. Uh, this is an architecture that's designed for those kinds of problems. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about the technology afterwards. I didn't want to make an 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. talk be too uh, deep, deep technology. So you all have a copy of a, a white paper. We're working on, on building a new version of that white paper. We have plenty of other material we can share with you if you're interested. Uh, what is NuaDB designed for? It's designed for all these things we've been talking about this morning. Uh, it's designed for global operations. Um, it's designed for on-demand capacity, for continuous availability, for the idea that you can, at any given time, say, I need more capacity, and you just start a machine. And there's no rehashing information. There's no reassigning anything. You just start it, and you walk away. And when it fails, your service keeps running. And because it's built around a policy-driven model, you can automate the process of bringing new resources online immediately to compensate. So it's a really resilient system. It's a system that's always there. Uh, it's also built around a notion that increasingly, while some people care about scaling out a single database, other people really see challenges more around multi-tenancy, around how you run hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of independent databases. Again, the audit question, security question, separation. Uh, how do you make sure that those different users can get the SLAs that they need? How are you cost effective uh, in making sure that if you're supporting 200 different tenants, and some of them need a lot of capacity, some of them need little capacity. Suddenly one day, one of them needs 10x the capacity they need. How do you manage that? These are all the kinds of challenges that we're looking at going forward. Uh, and increasingly this question of multiple models. We're really focused on, not today in the product we ship, um, although we've, we've built some interesting things already, we just haven't started kind of exposing them. Uh, but we're very interested in the databases of the future, what will they need in terms of being able to commingle models, to be able to work with different application sets, being able to ask different questions on the same data? Uh, what's going to happen when we go forward and we discover new models we want to program? With? Uh, put another way, NuaDB is a single logical service with global consistency. As I said at the start, it's kind of the thing you need to take existing applications and migrate them. And does it work? Well, you know, a database talk would be a database talk without graphs. YCSB is not a very interesting benchmark for a relational database, I don't think, but it's a good example of on-demand scaling. Uh, more interesting to people, I think, can you take existing applications and move them? Well, that means can you get the gold standards of benchmarks, one of them being TPCC. Uh, this is recent developer internal benchmark that shows taking NuaDB and scaling it out on very cheap, like $500 commodity systems, uh, and showing that as you scale out, you get transactional throughput on a standard, standard OLTP benchmark, right? And I think the numbers here are less interesting than the fact that this is, you know, this is my evidence that yes, in fact, when I say NuaDB is a database that is designed to do scale up but still provide global transactional consistency, there's your, there's your illustration of that. Cloud architectures, what have we talked about this morning? We, we've talked about kind of a, a, a broad set of topics we talked about um, kind of how the industry is changing, uh, how, how the, the, the notion of how we work with our data and our systems is changing. Uh, and so I think the things I'll leave you with are when you're thinking about cloud, when you're thinking about the platforms that you're building, uh, it's pretty exciting, but there is rapid change. A lot of things that are harder to work with, a lot of things as a result that become easier to deploy once you have your platform right. Look for core platform services that are distributed architectures that are on demand. Uh, think about layering, abstraction, the ability to support and kind of gracefully react to failures is how we make these systems scale. Uh, and assume your needs will evolve. 
know, even in the time that we've had UODB on the market, the changes that have happened have been amazing. And the changes that are going to happen in the next few years are incredible. And so plan with scale in mind, but it's not just about, you know, today you need, you know, however many uh, transactions per second, and you think a year from now you need 10x, or today you need five terabytes of data, and next year you need 20 terabytes of data. Think about all the other things that are gonna scale, are gonna change. Uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about NuaDB, there's several of us uh, sitting in the back, um, and myself here in front, we'd be happy to talk more with you about what NuaDB is specifically. Um, and always happy to come back down here to New York and, and kind of talk through the architectures, but for those of you who want to learn more uh, on your own, uh, dev.nuadb.com is the starting point to find our product documentation, to read about what we actually support in terms of SQL, which is full ANSI 92 with 99 extensions, things like that. So real SQL, uh, kind of to learn more about the, the tools and drivers we support, uh, to learn about uh, from our engineering blog, kind of how we really built the system, to find our white papers, to find documentation. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I want to say, again, thank you to everyone for coming out this morning. Uh, I, hope, I hope this was interesting. I will stick around for a few questions. <laughs> Eric, you have a comment you want to throw out as well. Yeah, uh, first off, let's give a very big round of applause. <laughs> After q and I'd like everybody to check your emails. You have a survey in there. It's really short. It's just multiple choice. It's like four multiple choice questions. One person who fills out that survey before the end of this um, breakfast is going to walk away with this um, drone, pardon me, uh, with this drone. So. Uh, please do check your emails, and we'll go on with the questions. What's yeah. the Wi-Fi password? I don't know. <laughs> no problem. Does anybody know the Wi-Fi password? Grand Hyatt. Grand Hyatt? Is that all right? Okay, Grand and, Hyatt. And NuaDB does not condone flying drones in illegal <laughs> spaces to do illegal yada yada yada. So I found the drone. And, and we're gonna we're gonna take a few QA questions now, and then afterwards. Seth will be here for one-on-one -on -one questions, and there's a bunch of people from NuoDB sitting on the back wall. Feel free to walk up and ask them questions as well. So yeah, so while everyone's filling out the forms, we'll take a few questions. Question right here. Uh, you said that the PMS stands, meaning uh, the transactional uh, engines and the storage uh, managers, they, they can talk to each other as peer-to-peer. That's correct. Yeah, so the question, the question was about the security model. If this is a peer-to-peer -peer system, what are the challenges of the security model? Um, so yeah, so new, out of the box, um, all of the peer processes are, are mutually authenticated and speak over confidential channels. Um, today, the only, today we support one cipher there. Uh, part of what we're building is the ability to kind of be flexible and, and plug in different ciphers. Um, but the, the default model is that everything is speaking confidentially. That's also true for the SQL clients. So SQL clients are out of the box speaking over encrypted channels to the database. Um, and the management tier, which I didn't talk much about, uh, but there's a whole management tier built into the system that also uh, uses uh, uh, encrypted channels to speak to the database. Uh, beyond that, it's a standard SQL database. So of course, once you're connected to a database, users, roles, privileges, kind of all of those things that you'd expect in terms of, in terms of security to the system. Yeah, question right here. So there's the idea of the data locality and good practices on not having everything all over the place, but what if you are trying to do sort of a, a big analysis and you want to get information from all over, is there some like governor or way that it'll go and say, okay, we're gonna do this and it's gonna go slowly so it doesn't overwhelm the rest of the resources? Or how would you do like a big type of analysis? All right, so that's, that's a great question. So the, the question for everyone heard it is, if you really want to do some, some giant analysis of data, but you've got your data intentionally separated in lots of different places, how do you do that in a way that you can do the analysis effectively, but you don't swamp the running system, essentially? Um, and I think what, what we've tried to do at NuaDB is, is the thing that you see a couple other companies trying to do now, which is understanding there is no one right answer to that. Right? So we, we provide a couple of mechanisms for doing that. Uh, one is you could choose to store your data in multiple locations, and then you could also choose to store all your data redundantly in a particular location, so that when you want to do that analysis, you always have it, because what you really care about is the response time of the analysis. 
Um, that's one choice you can make. Another choice you can make is to say when you want to run that large scale analysis, what you want to do is you want to allocate some machine with a lot of memory in it. Um, and you're going to spin up another one of these database processes there for the sole purpose of running this analysis. Uh, and then it will be able to bring into its cache all the objects it needs. Uh, and then it will be able to work you know, locally in memory. Um, and that's, that's another model. Uh, the third model that we do not implement today, but we're looking at, is how to kind of take the best of the, the kind of SQL declarative and, and SQL optimizer view of the world and kind of what the best practices are in the Hadoop and, and scale out world and, and put them together. Because right, an obvious answer to your question is, well, if you just did like, if you just did MapReduce, like you could just say like things are sitting in caches in lots of places, and you know, lots of places go out, fan out, and do that analysis. And of course, the answer is that's great, except for the part where you want, you don't want to be affecting the, the running nature of the system. You want to be able to make local optimizations as well as global optimizations. Again, one of the really nice things about SQL as a declarative language and kind of the notion of the, the, the role of a SQL optimizer in there is that the optimizer is there to understand how to, how to optimize something, how to make the right decisions for something like this. And so one of the things we're looking at is how does the optimizer become something that's not kind of just the traditional SQL notion of like, which column do I look at first because of indexes or something like that. But how do you make decisions about what things, where you, you know, wh what are queries where you should bring data to the query and what are queries where you essentially should distribute the query to data and, and when does that become disruptive or when does that have kind of global optimal um, so kind of two or three solutions that we give customers today, um, and then some interesting kind of next generation ideas we're looking at. Could, could we follow up to the second solution? Where sorry, I, I'm sorry. Okay. Quick follow up to the second. I just also want to add, since that's kind of a wicked hand wave, uh, we do actually have customers in deployment today who are doing exactly that thing you just said, who are running um, and, and are, are building out systems that would be kind of partitioned, running data in many different places, mm -hmm. but then want global analysis in real time. Essentially, and so this is this is uh, that is a workload that we actually support today that we work through with our customers. Today. So in that second scenario, where you spin up a node specifically to solve like the processing overhead, mm -hmm. does that in some way throttle the I/O because that's sort of uncontained? If it really wants all the data, you might be swamping your networks and everything else. Right. So it it could, um, and and that's and that's why kind of this on-demand nature and this this peer coordination nature of our system is important right? because what that node is going to do is it's going to come up. And then as you're running a query and it realizes that it starts needing data, it's going to go out and start getting that data. Right? But it's not going to kind of just swap the system and say, I need all the data. It's going to say, like, as I'm building up knowledge of what I need in this query, I'm going to go out and find objects. Uh, and so it's going to, in that, in that sense, it's going to work like any other system, any other node in the system. It's not going to like suddenly swamp something and say, like, I'm reading everything off this disk and I'm like just messing with this disk IO path. And it's going to distribute. It's going to go to all the different nodes in the system. So it's going to like pull something from this node, pull something from memory here, pull something from disk here, pull something from memory over here. Um, and it will do that uh, in a fashion, you know, kind of as that query is running. So it actually doesn't end up swapping the system. Um, does it end up having kind of net impact on the system? Yeah, of course it does. Because that's the nature of saying now, I didn't have data sitting here before, and now I want data sitting here before, right? So what are the options for that? Well, you can say that's fine. I'm willing to pay that cost. I'm already over provision. Uh, you can say what I'm going to do is when the system's a little bit quieter, I'm going to warm this cache. Um, or even forget about just quieter. You can just say, like, if you're really concerned about that, you can just ease into it and say, do bits of the query, bits of the query, start to bring stuff into that cache. And as that cache is really warm, then you can start running the big queries and you know you have everything there you need. So again, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's really not a one size fits all. Some of our users are fine to say, like, on demand, I just really. I, I need to be able to run this query, start something up, run the query, shut it down. The rest of the system keeps running totally normally. Um, other people are running with such large data sets that you do see an impact, uh, in which case we have ways to, to help that. Thank you. Okay. Yes? Do you have a notion of, poli of, of policy around data locality? So like, for example, you know, there's different regions, and you, know, you said there's regulations around where the data resides. Is that a problem you're trying to solve where you know a new a new sort of piece of data comes in and then the system kind of figures out where it really needs to live? That is so uh, I'll, I'll I'll answer the question in the reverse order you asked it. That is a that is a problem we're trying to solve. We do not today encode policy into the system for that. Um, mainly because we're still trying to figure out what the right ways to do that. Um, 
So there's not there's not a lot out there yet that's kind of the standard way of expressing that policy. So we're actually working, uh, I'm, I'm working with a few standards groups in industry, uh, working with some university groups, working with some of our customers, trying to understand what the right way is. And if you some thoughts, I'd love to, to chat about that. What we have is we have all the building blocks. We have the mechanisms in our system to be able to tag information, to be able to say a certain piece of data can only live in particular places, and then to be able to build the auto model around that. So we have kind of all of the core capabilities in the system, and what we're trying to do now is say we also have this policy-based model for the system that says here's where you run processes and why, and so we're trying to figure out how do we expand that to be able to express those kinds of rules. So not, not something we automate in the system today, uh, but that's that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to understand is how to express those rules cleanly. Yes. You mentioned all the connections are encrypted. I'm going to a small trivia point. I presume you're using something like TLS. We're not. No. Okay. How are you distributing the authentication? Uh, so that's a that's a uh, that's a harder thing to answer without a whiteboard in front of us. The short version is we're using we're using an IETF standard called SRP. I don't know if you're familiar with okay. SRP. So SRP is in a class of protocols that came out at the same time as things like uh, Eek and Speak and some other protocols kind of the late 90s, start of the millennium. Uh, it's in a class of protocols that's designed to take a weak secret like a password or something else that's kind of easily generatable and turn it into something kind of with the cryptographic equivalence of a public private key pair. So you're, um, not using, you're not using uh, expired lines we're not using X509 certificates today. No, we're, we're building into the product support for being able to build up authentication. We're building into the product the ability to use a standard PKI if that's what we want to use to bootstrap it. Uh, what we've tried to do is we've tried to build something that doesn't require kind of additional infrastructure or pre-provisioning of X509 certificates or some kind of hierarchy. Well, I'm actually, the, the, place, the place I'm going is that some of the various industry standards for handling private data all out specific cryptological uh, requirements. Sure, absolutely. And the question is, does the back channels meet those standards? Yes, but many of those standards are much more about the data at rest than they are about the data both from within. Yes, <coughs> that's true. So the way we think about encryption of data at rest is separate from how we think yes, about data obviously. passing through the system. And for most of the people we've worked with, having Assurance that the system is, you know, that these, it's, it's not about is it TLS or X509 or whatever else like that. It's usually about the cipher. And, and to be fully transparent, that's actually the thing that we're, we're working hard on right now is being able to provide choice of different ciphers because today the cipher we use between peers is RC4. Um, so, and so improving that to AES and improving yeah, yeah. that to other ciphers is actually much more, much yes, more interesting that's today. Yes. Um, at, the same, but we're, at the same time that we're doing that, we're also going back in and saying, okay, so. How do, we, how do we use standard protocols like TLS? I was involved in the ITF and the ITU around X509. Um, I've actually done a complete implementation of the attribute certificate X509 model, which not many people have used. No, it was great fun. I enjoyed it. I had to write a, a lot of ASN1, but you know, these things happen. We move on. Um, so yeah, all, all interesting things we're working on. Yes, question. <clears throat> what has been the most successful use case for you so far, and where Maybe conversely, do you believe uh, the customer is uh, would benefit the most from having more uh, technology? From having Mongo, is it? Or uh, from using MongoDB? So the, the question was, uh, what are the most successful use cases for NuaDB, and and where might someone look at a technology like Mongo instead? No, no, no. The question is, what have been the most successful uh, deployments for NuaDB with customer segments, mm -hmm. and perhaps if that's different. From what you believe, where Mongo should be. Okay, um, I think there's um, the the common thread for most of our users uh, is is kind of what I laid out here, right? That that they're that most of our customers are very much in the the enterprise mindset in terms of operational models, trying to move their operational systems into into scale out architectures. Um, and so, what are the what are the most successful applications? These are the these are the heavy lifting operational systems, um, session management, logging, counts, uh, user information, uh, audit trails, um, the, the things that you see kind of time and time come up, especially in places like telecom, places like energy, um, places like healthcare. Uh, those are the those are the kinds of applications 
where, um, where most of our users are successfully deployed today. And we have a number of users deployed both on-premise and in public clouds. Those are the kinds of things that they're, that they're building. Um, I'm not sure whether what you're, what you're asking kind of is where people who are using, who have tried NoSQL solutions would find this an interesting thing to look at, or? Well, it's more so, as, uh, you know, we are a software vendor ourselves, and sometimes you have a preconceived notion of what is the customer, what's the market segment that you build it for, and then it turns out the traction is somewhere else. So but you see that, you know, your belief is that in that customer segment should be, you know, the, the, the flagship user of UODP, meanwhile, the market should take you somewhere else. I see. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure there is a place where this is, um, where this is less or more appropriate. I mean, I think that my, my, my feeling coming out of everything we talked about today, right, is that we're really in this period where we're, we've been building things for a long time, kind of accepting truths about things you can't do. And what's really fun about the industry, not just NuaDB, but a number of technologies, is we're kind of, we're challenging that and thinking about that realizing that actually, you know, 10 years ago, if you'd had something like this, you might not have gone to a NoSQL solution. That said, NoSQL solutions aren't just like a pragmatic way of getting scale. There are application developers who really like the idea of getting rid of schema. There are application developers who really like the idea of building something that pairs directly to their, to their application model. So like web developers who are living and breathing JSON um, because that's what they're thinking about 100% of the time, and they want the fastest, simplest possible way to take data out of that model and put it into, the, into their store, um, are probably looking for something more like, like a Mongo um, than they are looking for a relational database. Uh, and so I said, you know, I made the comment that today what we're really focused on is we're focused on the SQL users of the world, uh, because I think those are the users who most appreciate kind of not just the application interfaces, but the operational pain of having a system that isn't designed with backup and recovery, that isn't designed with online upgrade, that isn't designed kind of with that resilient notion. Um, over time, I think more and more the people who are looking at that front-end programming model will care less if their back-end model is storing data on disk in JSON or whatever, and will care more about, is it a thing I can work with effectively? And so certainly what we're moving towards is being able to say, how do we take all of that, all of those kind of non-functional requirements, if you will, provide a platform that also from the front end is simple to program to from those worlds, but that, that hasn't been where our focus is today. Our focus really has been on the people who kind of appreciate those traditional enterprise challenges, which tend to be kind of in that, you know, small $35 billion a year secret market. Any one more question, and then we can see where the, yeah. where the surveys are? Question. Yes, please. Yes, you've been, you've been reading the white paper. Um, so uh, the, the question was about atoms. Can I talk a little bit more about atoms? Uh, so for those of you who look in the white paper or come to our, come to our tech blog um, or, or ask us to, to come in and give you a little bit more follow-up on the internals, a NuaDB database is, uh, we think about the data as decomposed into a collection of objects. And we call these objects atoms. The, the history of that is that um, our, our technical founder thought about calling them objects, but at the time there was a lot of kind of religion and frustration around the object databases, and he didn't want to be kind of lumped into that world, so we decided to pick a, a new word, basically, to say we, just, we won't even go into that argument. This won't be about object-oriented programming, this won't be about object databases, it's, they're just things, they're called atoms. Um, and uh, of course the atom metaphor almost works until you realize that atoms themselves contain a whole lot of things. Um, so you kind of have to, you end up splitting atoms and you end up doing, you know, kind of the physics is a little questionable in our system, but just go, go with metaphor for a second. So atoms, um, atoms represent the internals of the database. Uh, and so the way to think about the data in a database is we, we, we chunk it up kind of similarly to the way uh, pages work in, a, in an existing database where pages a, is a section of the database. But I said earlier, we don't really think about, you know, it's not about pages, here's why. An atom is a kind of an arbitrary piece of the database that is grouped by the role it plays. So we have data atoms that have the data. Um, we have atoms that represent the metadata. So this is a version controlled system, MVCC. So we have atoms that, that have kind of metadata about the data, including the current versions and kind of other rules about the system. 
Uh, we have atoms that represent table structure. So we have objects that, that show what, what a table looks like, and within that table, what data atoms are in that table, what indexes are in that table. So we also have index atoms um, that represent specifically the indexing data. We have schema atoms. Schema atoms are the atoms that, that, that capture the structure of the database. Um, schema atoms are really nice because, among other things, it means that when you go from the SQL view of the world to this internal object representation, that's the mapping point. And so if you want to change the schema, you go find the schema atom, you make the change, and from there on out, every time you map data from the object representation to its SQL view, now it, it appears as this new schema view. So changing schema is real time and doesn't require going and mucking with stuff on disk. It's just changing that one thing. Uh, we also have things we call catalog atoms. And catalog atoms are the distributed name service that tell you where to find all the other atoms. And so they let us know at any given time I need a particular object, I don't have it in cache, but I know two other places have it. One of them is a peer that keeps data in cache, and so I can go to that peer. It's going to be microsecond resolution, typical networks go get it, so I can go get data, work with it very effectively. Um, those catalog atoms are also how we know when we're running transactions uh, which other peers might have the same data in cache and therefore who we need to coordinate with. Uh, what's nice about these objects, these atoms, is that they, they give us a very simple way to say, here's not just a collection of data, but it's like-minded data. You know, when, when, you bring, when you bring a data object into your cache, you're bringing it there because you want to work with all the, all the records in it that represent kind of rows in a table. So you're, you're bringing it into cache because it's going to sit there, it's going to be worked with in a particular way. When you're bringing an index atom into cache, uh, you're doing something completely different. You're reifying part of an index tree. And so, it serializes the same way, it's identified in the same way, we have all the same common mechanisms for coordinating around these objects, but when it actually gets to memory someplace, it's gonna do something different. Um, therefore, we also might do things about prefetching differently, we might do compression differently, we might do other kinds of optimization differently on an atom by atom basis based on the roles they're playing. On disk, they're just all encoded objects with, with some identity associated with them. Um, but it's a nice primitive, it's a nice kind of base currency for coordinating around all of our peers. It's a simple way of kind of chunking up the system uh, to the question about uh, uh, governance and kind of how you think about data. It gives us a way to say we know that all of this data in this cache, in, in this object, in this atom, uh, is, is uh, you know, has one rule applied to it about where it can live. And so we don't have to think about kind of every record where it lives in terms of internal coordination. We have a much simpler mechanism for deciding where, where things can or can't be stored. Thank you very much, Seth Proctor. Thank you very much. All right, everybody ready to the drone? Uh, Knox, how do I actually get the results up on the projector? So I have the survey uh, responses here. And so 25 people filled it out. And I'll just use a random number generator. Okay. So you're gonna call, you're gonna call it out. The twenty fourth person, which is uh, Aiden Doyle. 